This is an amazing book. This book is called What is Mathematics? And it was written by Courant and Robbins. And there's nothing I can say in this video that really explains how great this book is. This book should be like required reading for every mathematics major in the entire world. This is the inside cover of the book. It says price $10 each. I think I paid like $30 for this book. It's pretty old. Let's open up the flap here. What is mathematics? By Richard Courant, head of the Department of Mathematics, New York University, and Herbert Robbins, instructor in mathematics, New York University, Oxford University Press. Copyright 1941 by Richard Courant. And yes, this is the same Courant from the Courant Institute. So it's the same person after which the Institute is named. Printed in the United States of America. Here are the dedications dedicated to Ernst, Gertrude, Hans, and Leonore Courant. I should mention Courant was a German-American mathematician and he fled Germany in 1933. Let's just read small bits of the preface. For more than 2000 years, some familiarity with the methods and results of mathematics has been regarded as an indispensable part of the intellectual equipment of every cultured person. Today, some educational administrators are trying to demote mathematics from its traditional place. Their policy cannot be charged altogether to malice or ignorance. Yeah, very interesting because a lot of people have similar views today. And it's funny because this book was published so long ago, 1941. So it shows that not much has changed. Actual contact with the content of living mathematics is necessary. And I feel like that is the theme throughout this book. This is not a book on philosophy. It is not a book on, you know, why mathematics should be this way or that way. It is a book on actual mathematics and Courant explains it in a brilliant way. Here he talks about how to use the book and I just want to read one sentence to you. It says, for example, the historical and philosophical introduction might best be postponed until the rest of the book has been read. In other words, Courant is more interested in actual mathematics. I'm, I'm getting goosebumps because I've spent a great deal of time reading various sections in this book and he just explains so well. And I'm gonna show you some of the really cool stuff that I've read in this book. Also, this is a very thick book. I mean, look how thick it is. You can just, mm, I can smell the pages, just a work of art. This is a really cool section where he talks about the mathematical analysis of infinity. And so basically how I use this book is I just basically open it up and whatever page it lands on, I read a little bit. So a few days ago, I was laying in bed and I opened this book up and I landed on this page. So this is really cool and this is extremely well written. I've never seen a more clear explanation of infinity uh, than in this book here. Here Courant talks about what it means for two sets to be equivalent. He says, if the elements in two sets A and B may be paired with each other in such a way that to each element of A there corresponds one and only one element of B, and to each element of B corresponds one and only one element of A, then the correspondence is said to be bi-unique and A and B are said to be equivalent. This is super important because now you can compare two sets and you can determine if they're equivalent. And the notion of equivalence for finite sets coincides with the ordering notion of equality of number. Since two finite sets have the same number of elements if and only if, the elements of the two sets can be put into a bi-unique correspondence. This, this is in fact the very idea of counting, for when we count a finite set of objects, we simply establish a bi-unique correspondence between those objects and the set of number symbols one through n. Wow, just incredible. And here he goes on to talk about infinites. He says, Cantor's idea was to extend the concept of equivalence to infinite sets in order to define an arithmetic of infinities. The set of all real numbers and the set of all points on a straight line are equivalent, since the choice of an origin and a unit allows us to associate in a bi-unique manner with every point P of the line, a definite real number X as its coordinate. Then here he talks about the integers, and he goes on to show that the set of integers is equivalent to the set of even integers. And you can do that by simply listing the integers, one, two, three, four, five, and then to each integer, you assign the following. So for one, you assign two. To two, you assign four. To three, you assign six. Basically, you just double each integer. 
and you see you have this bi-unique correspondence between the set of positive integers and the proper subset of even integers, which are thereby shown to be equivalent. This contradicts the familiar truth. The whole is greater than any of its parts. Shows what surprises are to be expected in the domain of the infinite. I'm getting goosebumps. This guy, Courant, was amazing. Now, for rational numbers, it's not so simple. You can do the same thing, though, with rational numbers. And I think the best way to illustrate that is with this diagram here. So basically, you list the numbers, all the integers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then you create this chart. So you take 1, and then you divide it by 2, by 3, by 4, by 5. Take 2, divide it by 2, by 3, by 4, by 5, etc. Take 3, divide it by 2, by 3, by 4, by 5, by 6, etc. Do that for each of the integers. And then you can trace out all of the numbers, okay, all of the numbers using this system here. And then you basically eliminate duplicates. For example, if a fraction appears uh, more than once, um, you eliminate it and only write it once. Let me show you how to actually trace this out. Let me just briefly show you how to actually trace this out because if you look in the book here, you can see the pattern, but you don't actually see it on the numbers. So it's actually pretty simple. Basically, you start here at one, and then you go across like this. Okay, and then you come down, and then you go down one like this. Okay, and then you go back up. Then you go across. Then you go down here like this, and you see we're getting every single number in this beautiful chart. And then basically you list them. Okay, you just keep doing this forever and you list them and then you eliminate duplicates. It's a really beautiful argument. Here's a beautiful diagram that shows that there are just as many real numbers between zero and one as there are real numbers. So Courant talks about how you can take the unit interval, which is this here, and you can bend it at one third and at two thirds. And you can put a point here and you can just project that point by drawing lines. And you see if I draw a line here, it touches here and it touches here. So there's a correspondence now between those two points. Do the same thing here. You have a point here and a point here. So you have a correspondence, a bi-unique correspondence, between all of the points on the real line and all of the points on the unit interval. And this shows uh, that they are equivalent sets. You does the same thing here with two different line segments by putting a point here and projecting the lines down so you see this point corresponds to this one, and conversely, this one corresponds to this one. So you have a bi-unique correspondence between all of these points, and he does that with just some simple pictures. It's just really beautiful. Here he gives a proof by contradiction. It says, let us assume that the set of all points on the line between 0 and 1 can be arranged in the following sequence. So A1, A2, A3, etc. And what he's going to try to show here is to prove that you can't actually um, count uh, all of the numbers between 0 and 1. In other words, the set is not denumerable. So basically, suppose it is, and you suppose you could just list them all, a1, a2, a3, and then he encloses the point uh, with coordinate a1 uh, in an interval of length 1 over 10, and the point with coordinate a2 in an interval of length 1 over 10 squared, and so on. And then he says, if all of them between 0 and 1 were included in this sequence, the unit interval would be entirely covered by an infinite sequence of overlapping subintervals of length 1 over 10, 1 over 10 squared, 1 over 10 cubed, etc. The fact that some of these extend beyond the unit interval does not influence our proof. And then if you look at the sum of these lengths, you get 1 over 9. And that's impossible, right? Because thus the assumption that the sequence contains all real numbers leads to the possibility of covering the whole of an interval of length 1 by a set of intervals of total length 1 over 9, which is certainly absurd. Yeah, just really, really beautiful. Then here he goes on and talks about how this relates to measure theory. Replacing the intervals above by smaller intervals of length epsilon over 10, where epsilon is an arbitrary small positive number, we see that any denumerable set of points on the line can be included in a set of intervals of total length epsilon over 9. And since epsilon was arbitrary, the latter number can be made as small as we please. In the terminology of measure theory, we say that a denumerable set of points has measure zero. So you can prove that using a, a similar argument here, as he just explained. So, I mean, he's talking about measure theory only a few pages after introducing 
you know, the notion of two sets being equivalent. I mean, what a fantastic book. Here he talks about Euler's number E. He talks about how it has had an established place in mathematics alongside the Archimedean number pi ever since the publication in 1748 of Euler's Introductio in Analysin Infinitorum. And it provides an excellent illustration of how the principle of monotone sequences can serve to define a new real number. And he goes through it here and defines the number E. And then if you turn the page here, he proves that E is irrational. So he gives a little proof here showing that irrational. And now to understand this proof, you do have to read all of this because he uses some of the information on this page. But anyone with some math background, I think, could actually understand this. This is a really cool section on continued fractions. And this is really cool, let me show you. So take this number here, x equals the square root of two minus one, which is apparently a root of this equation. So if you factor out an x here, you'll get x times x plus two. You divide by that and you get this, okay. So now what you do is you know that x is equal to one over two plus x. So take this x here and replace it with one over two plus x. So you get x equals one over two plus, but what's x? My finger's covering it. Oh, it's one over two plus x, boom. Then you do it again, my finger's covering it. Now look down here, boom, you see that? There it is, right, there it is. My finger's covering the x, now it's there. And you keep doing that forever and you get, uh, in this case, n steps of this sequence. And then over here, basically what he's done is he's replaced x with um, the square root of two minus one and then added one to the other side. And then he's let, there's the one, and you let n go to infinity and you get this infinite continued fraction as he says. Really cool, right? That you can express the square root of two as an infinite continued fraction. And he gives some more examples here of how you can express other numbers as infinite continued fractions. And then here he talks about E. I mean, that's really cool, right? And there's a couple other ones here. Just, yeah, very, very cool. What an amazing book. So I got a little carried away and I never showed you the contents. So let's carefully go through the contents so you can actually see what's in this book because it covers a lot of mathematics. And I'll be honest, my problem with this book is I'll pick it up and I'll start reading it and I can't put it down because it's so interesting and Courant is such a good writer. So here he talks about the natural numbers. Okay, then a little more on the theory of numbers, all kinds of topics here, all kinds of subtopics and stuff, which is really just quite unexpected. I don't think there's any other book like this. Here he talks about the number system. Let's turn the page. This is that section on the mathematical analysis of infinity, complex numbers, algebraic and transcendental numbers. It talks about sets, geometrical constructions, all kinds of topics here. Projective geometry, here's some more topics here, just all kinds of things that you wouldn't expect to find. Topology, it talks about topology in this book. Functions and limits. You could actually learn calculus from this book. Um, there's enough calculus content in this book, more than enough to actually learn calculus. The only thing that's missing uh, from this book to actually learn calculus with it is the exercises. You would need some exercises for extra practice if you really wanted to learn, but um, it's enough to you know, offer a full treatment of calculus, maxima and minima, all kinds of topics. Some more topics here. And then here you have the calculus, talks about the integral, the derivative, so all the things that you would see in a calculus class, right? Or at least a lot of the things you would see. And then here's the last of it, infinite series and infinite products. Then you've got uh, an appendix with all kinds of things in it, right? Really cool. Even technique of integration, cool. Here he talks about topological properties. I thought this was really interesting and fairly well written. And if you know how to read, you can understand a lot of this. Um, you don't need a lot of math to completely understand it. Um, to understand it completely, you would need some math, but it's fairly well written in such a way that I think most people could read this and understand most of it. Here Courant talks about topological deformations. It says, the most intuitive examples of general topological transformations are the deformations. Imagine a figure such as a sphere or a triangle to be made from or drawn upon a thin sheet of rubber, which is then stretched and twisted in any manner without tearing it and without bringing distinct points into actual coincidence. And then here in parentheses, what he's referring to 
is the stuff on the previous pages, so I'll skip that. The final position of the figure will then be a topological image of the original. A triangle can be deformed into any other triangle or into a circle or an ellipse, and hence these figures have exactly the same topological properties. But one cannot deform a circle into a line segment, nor the surface of a sphere into the surface of an inner tube. Here you can see some topologically equivalent surfaces. Really cool and not the kind of thing that you would see at like the beginning of a topology book, right? This is something you would learn after you've studied topology for quite some time. Yet you can pick up this book and Courant talks about it right here. This is the chapter on the calculus. I love how he calls it that. Not just calculus, it's the calculus. And I'm just gonna show you some of the stuff in this book. Here you see the integral. Very cool. So it does have basic calculus, but the treatment is very, very different from what you would see in a, a regular calculus book. The concepts are the same, but the exposition, the way it's written um, is quite elegant, I think. So as much as I love this book, it is not a perfect book. And I think Courant knew that when he wrote it. The big thing that's missing from this book are the exercises. There are some exercises that randomly appear in the book but they are non-standard exercises and Courant admits that. That is not the intention of the book, right? I think that this is a great book for just learning new mathematics, being exposed to mathematics that you haven't seen and revisiting old mathematics in a much more clear way. I feel like Courant explains things a lot better than a lot of other authors. If you look on Wikipedia, he is known for this book. This is a very famous book. And again, the Courant Institute is named after this guy. It's Richard Courant, the German-American mathematician. Just, just brilliant. Yeah, really amazing. Here's a random section on the geometrical interpretation of complex numbers, which is also very well written. And I think this is something that most people can pick this up and they can read this and they can understand it. For example, here you see you have the complex number x plus yi. And then here you have the conjugate x minus yi. So you see geometrically how they are represented. It's like a mirror image across the x-axis. This is the section on functions and limits. And here he talks about how mathematicians and physicists sometimes put a different emphasis on the two different aspects of the function concept. And he goes on to explain it quite well. Here he talks about functions of several variables and he talks about how to think of them graphically. And he discusses level curves and you can see there's some diagrams here. And this is pretty cool. I mean, for a book uh, from 1941, I think this is fantastic. Here he has a section on the limit of sine x over x as x approaches zero. And he gives some computations here. And then he gives a rigorous proof geometrically of the statement here. So it's kind of nice. You learn this in a Calc 1 course. And this is one of those things that is often not taught in Calc 1 because it just takes up so much class time. So here you have a rigorous proof that Courant has provided in his beautiful book. I just noticed this mysterious stamp here in the back of the book. That's really cool. I don't know what that is. Yeah, wow. What an old book. Derivative and velocity, second derivative and acceleration. This is something that is typically taught in a Calc 1 course. And so you see it again here in Courant's book, which is really cool. The amount of mathematics that this book contains is really quite remarkable. And for the thick thickness of the book, I think it contains an incredible amount of math. Having said that, um, there are sections that are a little bit more terse and you know it does require some thought to read this book, but there's also no exercises. And so I think that really saves on um, pages. Perhaps the most shocking thing about this book for me personally is that I've realized that mathematics can be explained in a crystal clear way by some people. And I think Courant is one of those people. I mean, I guess I always knew that, you know, there's certain teachers that are just better than other teachers. Certain people are just better at explaining. And I think Courant was one of those people. I mean, this is a remarkable book. The explanations are crystal clear. Um, I have a hard time comparing this to other books I have. And I think it's worth picking up. I'll try to leave a link in the description in case you want to check out this book. I think it's worth it. I feel like it's one of those books that you'll buy and you can read for the rest of your life because it's so dense. It's got so much knowledge and you know, you just pick it up, sit down, maybe read for 20 minutes 
and you'll come out a little bit smarter. It's What is Mathematics? And it's by Courant. It's a legendary book. I hope this video has helped you in some way. Good luck.